Yay. Uh, so hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Uh, I walked for five minutes to get here. So yeah, long trip, but it was nice. <laughs> uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, Go, a programming language that I've been using for the last three years. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background about what I've been doing with Go and uh, about my career in general. And this died. One second. Cool. Uh, this is going to be a pretty general overview of the language with the context of, OK, I, I know how to write in Python. I, I love Python. Uh, why could I use Go? Uh, how do I use it? So we're going to see things like, uh, I love generators. How do I use generators in Go? There's no such thing. Uh, can I do it? Uh, the, the answer is going to be all of those are going to be yes, of course. Uh, or uh, decorators, or uh, monkey patching, uh, all of those things that normally are reserved for more dynamic languages, how you can do the same thing with Go. So the goal to, for today is not to teach, to teach you Go. Uh, there's a class that I teach sometimes. It's around four hours. We don't have four hours, especially after a whole day of work. I don't think this is going to work. So uh, today, what I'm going to do is just try to convince you that it's worth having a look at it. And at the end, I will have some links to the Go tour and other resources that could help you learn more about Go. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end. But if you have any questions that are burning you at some point, just raise your hand and just ask me. OK, so the way we're going to do it is we're going to start talking about the things that uh, are similar between both Go and Python. And then we're going to talk, uh, sorry, yeah. And actually, it's the other way around. We're going to start talking about the things that are different. And then we're going to talk about the things that are the same. So a little bit of context about myself. Uh, as I said before, I'm Francesc. Uh, and I'm a developer advocate for Google, for the Google Cloud Platform. And I don't have access to the Wi-Fi. That should be a Google Cloud Platform logo. You can imagine that. Uh, it's, I don't have the logo. Whatever. It's a logo. It's cute. Uh, so, and I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. But at the same time, I spend most of my time writing Go. I joined Google four years ago, four, eh, around four years ago, as a software engineer for AdWords. And I was doing basically C++ and Python. And one of the coolest things I did was a SQL compiler from, uh, so yeah, a compiler from SQL to C++ written in Python. And that was lots of fun. Uh, the C++ code that I wrote was using things like multiple inheritance and templating and abstract classes. And then I got a bug one month ago, and I moved to a different team, which is Go Developer Relations. Uh, so I worked with the Go team closely for around a year, and then I've been doing basically Go on, on Google Cloud Platform. So App Engine runs Go, but also how to do like high computation, like high performance computation, or Things like Kubernetes, if you've heard about it, Docker, these kind of things. OK, so let's talk about Go itself. Go is a lot of things. First of all, it's open source. Uh, it's completely open source to the point that everything that I do, everything that the Go team does, is it happens externally. Once, so it happens on GitHub now, which is awesome. Uh, and on the mailing list. So you can find, you can see everything that is going around the community. And then, since we use it at Google, we actually put it from outside of Google to Google, and we put it in our third party directory. So like any other thing that comes from the open source community. It's statically typed, unlike Python, and this is something that I really like. We'll talk a little bit more about it. It's object oriented. If you ask me, if you ask someone else, the answer might be, no, it's not object oriented. I think that Go is more object-oriented than Java, uh, especially if you know about small talk. Go, it's object-oriented in the same way small talk is. And I think that small talk is more object-oriented than anything else in the world. So it's object-oriented. It's compiled, and it generates, uh, so it's compiled like C or C++, and it generates static, static binaries. And at the end, I will talk about it and how, why this is very important for nowadays. It's memory safe, unlike C or C++. We have pointers, and we, we won't see that today, but we have pointers in Go. Uh, but we don't have pointers arithmetics. 
which means you can, you can get the address of a variable, but then you cannot say, oh, add four and see what happens. Uh, that's not safe. So we actually allow you to do it with a package from the standard library that it's called unsafe. So you can do crazy things with it, but you should not use it in general. And it's type safe, meaning that even though we have a type that can, uh, you can put any variable in that type, it, we call it empty interface. And later we'll see why it's called the empty interface. Uh, we don't lose the type information. So uh, you can always come back to what type was this value here, and you will get the, 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 the it's an int, it's a boolean, whatever it is. Who uses Go? We use Go. Google uses Go. Otherwise, that could be sad. Uh, YouTube uses Go a lot. Uh, YouTube is written in Python <laughs> with a MySQL database. And that is well known to scale poorly, let's say. Uh, so between the, my, the Python uh, code base and the, my, uh, the, my, uh, MySQL, we have a layer of Go that basically makes MySQL be a, a cluster database uh, over multiple data centers and so on. So it handles replication and these kind of things. And it's written in Go. Sorry? Of course, my, Python is awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, no, but the problem is really, is really MySQL that it's hard to make it scale. Uh, and the, it's an open source project, by the way. It's called Vitesse if someone is interested by it. Uh, the download page for Google is also written in Go, so that's the one you use to download things like uh, Google Earth or Chrome or many other things. Used to be written in C++, and I think it was around two years ago, we decided that the C++ uh, code base was bad enough that it was worth starting from scratch and the best way to start from scratch is to use a different language. So we went with Go, and, and we're really happy with it. Uh, the performance is slightly lower than C++, but the memory usage is lower, because it turns out that garbage collectors collect garbage better than developers. So that was, that was a surprise for a lot of people. Then all the projects, uh, Docker, uh, Docker is very in Go, Kubernetes, uh, if you heard about it, is also written in Go. Uh, SoundCloud, Canonical, Cloudflare, Mozilla, and there's a long list of them uh, that keeps on growing every day. Um, I, I heard that, I heard that uh, Apple uses uh, Go, Facebook uses Go, so that's pretty cool. There's pretty much everyone uses Go. And if the name of the startup has cloud on it, they use Go, probably. You can go with it. <laughs> Uh, this is the very scientific way of proving that Go is very popular, Google Trends. Um, we are right now at 100, which is a lot, I guess. Uh, basically, it means that we've never been this popular before. But basically, what I like is that if you're optimistic, you could say it's almost exponential. If you're not optimistic, you will say it's linear. But still, it's growing pretty fast. Okay, so I write Go, I don't write Python. Why? Well, there's some reasons for that. And I'm gonna go over them, and it's gonna be short, so just hold it for a minute, don't worry. Something that I really like about Python is the fact that you can write something like A equals hello. And, and you don't need to say what A is, A is hello. And you can say B equals one. But then you can also say a equals two. So a used to be a string, now it's an integer. Now if you have a function that receives things like this, turns out that just in case, you should always check what's the type of the parameters that you actually received. Uh, there are solutions for that. Uh, so uh, there's Cython and MyPy, so basically uh, trying to add uh, anno type annotations to Python. And I really like it, uh, especially because what you get when you add type annotations to Go to uh, Python looks a lot like Go, uh, which is something that I really appreciated. <laughs> um, in Java C++, you don't have those things, but you end up having to declare variables saying, this is the type of the variable, this is the name, and this is the value. And in C++ 11, 11, 
I think it's 11, maybe 14. I don't remember now. But anyway, the latest C++, they removed this with the auto keyword, which is what Go does. Uh, in Go, you can write things like A is hello. A, A is now a new variable of type string. You didn't write it, but the compiler inferred that from the value that you passed. And it's not a variable that doesn't have a type because you didn't write it. It's a variable of type string. So if afterwards I try to put a two into A, it won't compile. So it's pretty much, it's statically typed like Java or C++, but you write it like Python. Okay, the thing that I like the least of Go, of now, Go, I love Go. The thing I like the least of, of, of C++, of, oh my God, of Python, many languages, is what's the output of this program? So, I'm gonna run it, and it says, well, random, it's one out of two, so it says, hey, Pathinista, you win, awesome. If I run it again, well, this is random, so we could be here all day. There you go. Uh, it just explodes. Why? Because on the, on the line there, I misspelled name as name. And this is something that there's tools to fix. Uh, there's tools that will detect these kind of things. But if you don't use those tools and you miss these kind of things, and that dot five is actually dot nine nine nine, it means that this could actually explode in production. Uh, and this is something that I really don't like. Uh, Go doesn't have these kind of issues. And there's a solution for this, which is code coverage. Just have 100% code coverage, and you will be sure that all your code works. And for me, code coverage is not about that. For me, code coverage is about finding parts of your code base that are not tested. Not meaning that you have to test all of them. If there's some parts of your code that are trivial or uninteresting, or you know they work because they're so simple and testing them is gonna be hard, don't test them, that's okay. But I really see a lot of people trying to, to reach that 100% of code coverage. And if you have all the time in the world, that's an awesome thing to do. But if you have time constraints, there's better things to do rather than getting to 100% of code coverage. Also, 100% of code coverage, it makes you feel like you don't have bugs. Yeah. <laughs> and there's also some things that I don't like. Uh, deploying in Python, uh, it's one of the languages. So uh, MongoDB you, uh, had uh, their clients, their common line uh, tools, written in uh, Python. And they had an issue, which is most of the bugs they received were from people that didn't have the correct version of Python, didn't have Python installed correctly, or were missing libraries. Uh, they moved to Go, and now Go is just a binary that you run. That's it. There's no dependencies. So we will talk a little bit more about it at the end. But this is something that I really hate when you have something like, oh, it works in, on my machine, therefore it works. Uh, there's a solution for that, Docker, basically. If you, in Docker, you can put all your dependencies inside. Uh, with Go, you don't need to do that. It just comes with it. Uh, Guido van Brossen says that go, the Python is not too slow. Not too slow doesn't mean very fast. Uh, for most of the things, it will, fa it will be fast enough. Uh, go is faster than that. So if you have uh, serious performance constraints, Python might not be the best choice. Uh, I know that normally in Python, what you could do for compu uh, numeric computation will be to use C to replace some part of the code base in C. In Go, you don't need to do that. And then something that I really don't like is the magic of Python. And when I say magic, magic in Python is two underscores. Anything that starts with two underscores, there's a lot of things that happen there that are actually pretty hard to follow. And I'm not saying that they're dangerous, which they may be, but I'm saying that the problem is that when you are reading the code, that those things are actually really hard to detect. So there's a lot of things happening behind that means that make your Python code hard to understand. There's side effects that you might be missing. And there's a list of magic methods in Python, and they're actually called magic methods, which I love. <laughs> they're actually, that's the actual name of the thing. 
And something that I really like, in it's concurrency, especially because nowadays we have, like on, on the Google Cloud platform, we just uh, released a machine with 32 cores. If you're not able to use those 32 cores at, uh, correctly, you're spending a lot of money for nothing. Uh, so Go uses, a lot of, uh, uses multiple cores very well. Python is pretty famous for having issues with the uh, uh, global interpreter lock. And there's a, a talk by David uh, Beasley about it. David Beasley is an advocate for Python and still talks about the awesome and awful things that happen with the global interpreter log. Uh, there's a link to that talk. It's, it's a great talk. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it to everyone. OK, we're good now. <laughs> nothing, 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 le nothing more about things I don't like about, about Python. Now we're going to talk about the things I do like. And the first thing is the Zen of Python. The Zen of Python is a really good statement of what a good language should be, I think. Except for the part of being Dutch, which I don't agree with. But that's OK. Uh, there's a talk that we prepared uh, with the Go team a long time ago. Actually, it was Andrew Duran. Prepared a talk called Go and the Zen of Python. And it's basically about how Go matches the Zen of Python, sometimes better than Python. Uh, it's a very interesting talk. It's also a little bit introductory, so it, you, uh, you could find it also. It's a, it's a good link to, to check after this. The fact that maps and lists and, well, hashes, no, dictionaries, sorry, dictionaries and lists and so on are part of the language, it's really nice. Uh, I come from C++. In C++, the first thing before you use a map is to ask you which one. And you spend a lot of time deciding, uh, and then there's many versions, and that might change. So am I using the STD? I'm using Boost. There's, there's going to be a lot of differences. In Python, there's, there's one implementation, the one from the language. And the good thing about it is that if that solution is not good enough, the whole community helps improve it. So it's, it's a good thing, I think. Also, the standard library, uh, the standard library of Python is very complete. You can find a lot of things that you might want to do in Python. You're going to find it in the standard library directly, directly. And again, it has the same effect. If those solutions are not fast enough, the whole community helps improving it. So it's this idea of push it, all pushing behind the same thing. And then the thing that I really like about Python is magic, which you say you don't like. But actually, it can be really fun to use. And you can do really amazing things. Uh, there's one thing that I think it's actually from Ruby. But the missing method that I don't know if you know what it is, like if you call a method that doesn't exist, rather than failing, just do something else, that's, that's amazing. And you can do great things with it. So magic is cool, but you have to be careful with it. OK, so now we're going to start seeing a little bit of code. Yeah. Uh, not really dynamic typing, but yeah, the fact that you are not really sure. Yeah, well, it's dynamic typing. The fact that I can when you, when I get a param when I have a parameter in a function, I'm not really sure what's the what's the actual type of the thing. So I could try to say, oh, a and b are integers, a plus b, and it turns out that a and b are nothing that you can add, and that will fail. I couldn't hear that. Runtime type, yeah, but what I'm talking about is when you write your code, the fact that in, when you're writing the code, statically, you cannot be sure that the values that you're getting are going to be the type that you expect. And there's things in Python to, to avoid that, like type annotations and so on, but they're not really part of Python effectively. Like They might come at some point. OK, so they, they will be. OK. By the way, yeah. F3107, which I just released, I thought it was so OK, yeah, there's free OK. I mean, there's, there's a lot of languages that are also adding this, like uh, what's the name? Um, the thing that the language that it's like a JavaScript version, TypeScript. TypeScript, which is, yeah, it's a good name, TypeScript. Yeah, JavaScript with types. Uh, it's pretty much so, solving the same, the same issue. And I think that's. Probably the good way to go, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty new. Uh, OK, so we're going to see a little bit of code, finally. This is Python, so that might look familiar. 
Uh, there's a Fibonacci function, and I'm sure you've all heard about Fibonacci functions because you've all went, uh, you all went through coding interviews, so that's what happens. Uh, that's Fibonacci, the first one using a loop, the second one using the, the recursion uh, version, and you can run it, and it prints the 10 first Fibonacci numbers. Nothing really magic in here. Now, let's see how to write this in Go. Now, yes, it's longer. Because uh, in Python, you don't use braces. So when you add braces at the end of every brace, you end up with more braces. So that's why it's slightly longer. But other than that, it's very similar. Let's see the differences between both. Uh, the first difference is that while in the Python version, we say uh, this Fibonacci, fib, and it receives n. Cool. What does it return? Well, it returns b. OK, what is, what type, what's the type of b? Well, we're adding it, so it should be uh, probably an integer. If you pass a float, will it work? Well. The first version doesn't work with a float. The second one does, though. So that's a little bit the kind of problem that you solve by adding types. If we see in Go, we say the function Fibonacci receives a parameter of type integer and returns an integer. And it's the same thing for both. Then uh, the way we declare variables is actually very similar. Uh, in Python, you can say a and b are 0 and 1. In Go, you say a and B are 0 and 1, exactly the same thing, except for the semicolon. In Go, uh, semicolon equals is to declare new variables. And this is something that uh, some people have called a gopher operator, because if you look at sideways, it looks like a gopher somehow. Uh, then there's a for loop. Uh, the for loop is like a normal for loop, like nothing really new there. Uh, and then we have something that a lot of people are surprised by, which is the parallel uh, assignment. So the fact that A and B equals B and A plus B. And this is really useful because writing Fibonacci without that turns out to be much harder. You have to use that third auxiliary variable that you don't need in this case. But that's exactly what you do in Python, so whatever. You already know that. Uh, Go, doesn't ha Go has that too. And then we return B. And that's, that's pretty much it. Um, if we run this, you get exactly the same numbers. Pretty simple. Now, if you are a Pythonista, you're going to say, what? You're not using a generator here? Because <laughs> this looks like the perfect place for a generator, right? OK, so Python generators are really cool. I really like them uh, because they're really simple to use. Uh, to be used from the consumer side of it is really simple. So in this case, uh, we just call. Uh, Actually, we're calling fib of 10, and we ran, we're doing a loop over it. So that works really well. That, that's really easy. And defining them, it's actually pretty easy. Now, the way it actually works, it's like this, which is not that beautiful to see, but you don't get to see that. Uh, the fact that you're all calling the same function over and over till it throws an exception, then you cut that exception, and then you continue. The good thing, you don't get to see that, but that's how it actually works. Now, if we write this, like if you, if you think about this as a set of processes that are running concurrently, you can see it pretty much like this. So you have the main thing and the fib function, right? Now, when you call fib of 10, you're actually creating that fib there. And then every single time you call the function, you're asking next, give me a value, next, give me a value, and so on, until some point where there's an exception, and you get the stop iteration exception, and then you stop. Cool. Now, this looks like concurrency, right? This looks exactly like two different processes that are working collaboratively to uh, give you a result. And this is the way you actually write uh, generators in Go using concurrency. So, before I show you the code, let's see a little bit about Go concurrency, how it works. We have two different concepts. We have uh, Go routines, 
and go routines are like threads. Now, they're not threads. They're much cheaper, much lighter. So if you know what a coroutine is, or a green thread, or there's, a many, there's many words for the same concept, and that's why we created a new one, because that's better. Uh, basically, because if you use one of the existing words, you're going to actually accept most of the features that they have, and we are slightly different, so go routines, not anything else. Uh, they're very, very lightweight. Uh, I've run on my computer a MacBook Pro, which is not, it's pretty old now, uh, 60 million Go routines in a process, and it works. Uh, it was to generate a uh, fractal. Now, I don't say that this is a good idea. This is actually indeed a very bad idea. Don't do it at home, but it works. And it actually finished faster than uh, the sequential version, rather than 25 seconds to took 16. So you can use it. You should not be afraid of using uh, concurrency in Go. Now, uh, to communicate between different Go routines, you could, so you could use the same format, that, the same ideas that you, we've used before. So using uh, mutexes and semaphores and these kind of things. But you don't have to. And actually, the solution that we provide with Go is to use channels. And channels are um, like pipes. You used to say like Unix pipes. But if you think about a plastic pipe, that's pretty much what it is. Uh, if you have a plastic pipe, there's two ends. And you can put stuff on one side and it appears on the other. That's pretty much it. Uh, there's two operations to a channel, sending things into the channel and receiving things from the channel. And a third operation, which is closing the channel. And closing the channel lets the consumer know that there's no more values coming. And that's it. That's everything you can do with a channel. Uh, by default, there's no buffer. There's no buffering. So if you try to, so if I try to receive fr something from a channel and there's nothing ready to be received, I block. If I try to send something into a channel and there's no one ready to receive it on the other side, I block. And which means that channels are not only a way to communicate but also a way to synchronize. Uh, on top of that, we have buffer channels, which you can use sometimes when you want to say, actually, if the channel, uh, if there's no one ready to receive. Still, just put the value there, and someone will receive it later on. OK, so if we use channels now, so what we had before, we had the main uh, function. Well, main function in Python, I guess. Yeah, and the Fibonacci function. And they were communicating by just calling functions. In Go, we actually put a channel in the middle. And now what we're doing is we're creating the channel first. Then we create the Fibonacci function, and we ask the Fibonacci function to send values into the channel. And then the main function receives them. At the end, the Fibonacci function closes the channel, and we, the main function, notice that and stop the iteration. So let's see how we do that. The Fibonacci function does pretty much the same thing that it did in Python. Now, two differences. The first one, yield, is not yield anymore. We're sending A, the value A, into the channel C. And that arrow operator, it means I'm sending A into C. That's a sending operation. And then at the end of the function, we're closing the channel. And then here on the main function, we have to do th multiple things. First of all, we have to create the channel. To create a channel, we use the make uh, keyword. So we're creating a channel of integers. Channels are typed, by the way. So you can also know exactly what's coming through a channel. Uh, and then we're calling the Fibonacci function in a different Go routine, so in parallel, in concurrency. And to do that, everything you need to do is add the keyword go before the function call. That's it. Now, when you add go before the function call, that function will be executed in the background, and the code won't wait for that function to finish before going on with what, whatever it's doing. So the next step is doing range, and range C is pretty much like the in uh, of Python, and it will iterate over all the values coming from the channel for as long as the channel is open. When the channel is closed, we exit the loop. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there was two at the same time. Data race. You. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. If this might work, editing with multiple pieces might not work. No, it doesn't work. Uh, so what it could happen is the 
So in this case, since there's only one Go routine left, and it's blocked reading from a channel that it's not closed, because if you don't close that channel, this range will never finish. So that Go routine, the main Go routine, will block, and the, um, the runtime will detect that and will send a panic, which is the equivalent of an exception, except that it's really exceptional. Uh, that, that happens, uh, that will just take the prom down. Yeah. Yes? No. Um, no, uh, asterisk. Uh, so, no, but there's people that do it. Uh, we used to have them, we used to have that, what we called the net chains. So a net chain is a channel of our network. But the problem with that is that uh, there's a guarantee that you have here, which is when you send the value to that channel, it will arrive to the other side, always. And now when you have a network in the middle, you cannot guarantee that. So how do you handle those errors? Becomes harder to manage. So there's, there's articles about how to do that, and it's easy to do. But if you care about your program being correct all the time, and you know network partitions are a thing that happen, uh, that's going to be pretty dangerous. So that's why we don't have them anymore. Uh, there's things like there's a project called Iris that allows you to do uh, com uh, parallel computation of the multiple machines in Go, and the UI that like the API that you're going to use are going to be channels, but there's going to be some things on top to actually manage those errors correctly. So if you want to do it, there's solutions that exist. Okay, so I forgot what's the next step. Oh, yeah. So if I have this code here, and it means that, oh, yeah, so I define my Fibonacci function, and let me remove that. I don't want people to believe that that's the way. Uh, if, if, you have, if I define the Fibonacci function, now the users of that function to be able to call it correctly, first they have to create the channel. Then they have to call the function in a different routine. If they don't do that, it will not work. And then they have to do range. If, uh, otherwise, we might have some issues because uh, if there's values left and things like that, go routine could be there locked forever. So this is dangerous. You're basically assuming that the developer that is using your API uh, will write correct code, which is a dangerous assumption to have. So rather than doing that, what we're going to try to do is do it so it's going to look like the Python version for x colon equals range of fib. Now to do that, our Fibonacci function is going to return a channel. So we'll, let's see how to do that. If we get all of this code inside of the function and we move it to a different, goal, a different function that it's going to be an anonymous function, we get something like, let me show you step by step. So this is the equivalent of, of the function we had before. But this is in a, in a completely, um, uh, completely independent function. Uh, this is what we call a uh, function literal, also known as lambda uh, expressions in some languages. Now, the type of this value is a function. It's a function that doesn't re uh, receive any parameters, doesn't return anything. Now, if I want to call that function, I have to add the parentheses. Now, what we're doing here is actually like if that function didn't exist at all and we had the code in the middle, because what we're doing is just calling that function, so nothing really new. So we create the channel, we start the Fibonacci function, and we return the channel. What's the, me the piece we're missing is the fact that the, that Fibonacci loop should be running in a different Go routine. So to do that, we just add go here. And that, that's it. So now what we have is a Fibonacci function that when you call it, returns a channel, and you can do a loop over that channel directly. And all the, f the fact that there's a concurrency happening behind the scenes is kept behind the scenes. The API doesn't expose that. Yes, go routines. Uh, so you can share variables, and you can have data races. Yeah, and we'll we'll see a little bit at the end of the talk, the things that we have to avoid that those problems, data races, and so on. Yes. Can you repeat that question? Sorry. 
Okay, so now I just realized that I should repeat the questions because otherwise they're not going to be into recording. So I'm going to repeat that question. <laughs> uh, so the question was, can you have more than one value coming out of a channel? Uh, the answer is no, but what you can do is use structs. So uh, we'll see structs in a minute. So you can have a, a value that is composed that has multiple fields inside. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no, in this case, you could have again a um, uh, panic because that could be a, a deadlock. And the runtime could detect the deadlock and say, you're not getting out of this. Now, if you had more than one, uh, so if you had many Go routines, this was the library, and then the runtime could not detect that. Uh, and then you get what we call a Go routine leak, which is like a memory leak, but rather than leaking memory, you leak Go routines. And that's one of the things that you have to, uh, so in Go, you, you start many Go routines very fast, and people that start learning Go are very happy about it. Now, you have to also remember to stop them at some point. And these are the kinds of things that we, there, there's a, a long talk uh, about concurrency patterns that manages these kind of things and the idioms that we have to make that work correctly all the time. There's also tools to detect that, those cases. So in that case, that's oh, in this case, what happens is that this, uh, so the close will happen at the end of this loop. So uh, every single time we send the value here, uh, this operation here and the operation of getting the next value could happen concurrently. And then after n times, which is 10, so after, after, 10, opera after 10 iterations, we could close the channel and the range then and good finish. That go routine could end, and the main go routine could also end correctly. Cool. So there's exercises that are on the web, but we're not going to do them. So if you want to learn more about Go and actually put this in practice, there's some exercises that I prepared, but we don't have time enough. Uh, anyway, so this is a little bit about concurrency. Uh, this is just how to do concurrency, how to do generators with concurrency in Go. But that concurrency in Go is much powerful than that. You can do many other things. So there are two talks that I advise you to, to check out. There is Concurrency Patterns by Rob Pike and uh, Google I.O. two or three years ago. And then the, 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 year, the year after, uh, Samir from the Go team, too, gave advanced concurrency patterns. And those talks are really interesting because you get to really see how we write concurrent systems in Go. Uh, it's not just about starting Go routines, it's also about managing them. How do you stop them? How do you limit how many you have? And these kind of things. So to, if you're curious about that, let's. Uh, all of the slides are online already, so uh, I, will, I think that the last slide contains a link to those. Okay, second part of the talk. Is Go object-oriented? Yes? Okay, let's see how to write object-oriented Go. Go has uh, structs. We don't have classes. So, and a struct is very similar to a class. Uh, but it's just a struct. There's, no, there's nothing magic attached to it. There's no virtual tables. There's nothing like that. There's just the data. That's it. So in this case, we have a type which is called name, which is a struct with three fields. All of them are strings, first, middle, and last. So that's an American name. And uh, we have a method declaration. So we're declaring a method string that returns a string. And we're, re we're declaring that method on the type name. Now, this n name here, it's what we call the receiver. And it's the equivalent thing of uh, Python self. There's uh, two important things. One is we make it explicit that this self, n, is something special. This is the receiver of the method. This is something important. So we put it outside of the rest of the parameters. And also, you get to choose the name who you want. So uh, you will see people writing things like self or this, and you can tell what language you're coming from. In Go, instead, what we write is something like a parameter. So a parameter for the elf type name could be n. So you use n. And then we're returning just uh, the name first, then the first initial of middle, and then the, upper, the 
family name in uppercase. So if you run this thing now, so William M. William Mike Smith will print William N. Smith, and you can see that we're, so our N is of type name, and we're calling n.string. So we, are, we effectively define a string method on our, our type name. Now, the cool thing, because this is not really new, everyone, everyone does this. Uh, the cool thing is that you can do this over any type, not only structs. So you could have a type called simple name, which is just a string, that's it. And now I want to define a method string over that type. Well, the same syntax works. So I'm defining the method string that returns a string on the type simple name. And what it returns is s as a string. So if you say, it's kind of hard to say, there's many strings involved, but basically it's just returning its value as, as the type string. There's a type conversion there. Because in Go, even if types are equivalent, they're not equal. It's, uh, types are not alias. Like in C, they're actually different types. So if you have a type Celsius, which is float 64, and a Fahrenheit, which is a float 64, if you try to do a zero Fahrenheit plus zero Celsius, that's not a valid thing to do, so it won't compile. Uh, now I said that you can define methods on anything, and that's false. You can define methods on types that you define in the same package, which means that in Go there's no monkey patching. You cannot add methods to types that already exist outside. Uh, this is something that uh, in Python you can do. This is something that in Ruby you can do and you do very, very often. In Go you cannot do that because it's good for your sanity in general. When you have a big code base and you have monkey patching, fancy, funny things can happen. Let's talk about duck typing. <laughs> and duck typing is something that I really like of Python. It's something that makes your code uh, grow very easily. Uh, basically, you have a type, you want to use it, you can use it. You don't have to say implements or satisfies or extends or these kind of things. You just have the, the good things, it just works. Now, duck typing, all of you, I guess, know what duck, duck typing is. Uh, it's a way of Python does typing. And it's about these things of, it, it, if it walks like a duck, and it quacks, quacks like a duck, and it's something else like a duck. And I never remember the whole thing. And that's actually an important thing, which is, uh, where is the list of features of a duck? Uh, you can find it on the Wikipedia. But it's kind of hard to remember, right? And what happens if, so what happens, uh, the, if you talk about ducks, it sounds really stupid, but if you start talking about object-like uh, object types, uh, all of a sudden, oh, sorry, file-like objects. So it's something that looks like a file, and it's something that you read on the Python documentation. What is exactly that? Well, you have to go and read it and find all the methods and values that you should expect to have in there. And what happens when what you think is a duck is not a duck, it quacks. Uh, it fails in production. And that's something that I don't like. The first part, I love it. The second part, that, I don't really like it that much. I want this to be verified at compilation time. And that's what Go provides. Uh, Go has a way of listing the features of a duck, which is an interface. And uh, so in this case, we have the stringer interface that's actually an interface that we have. And it is an interface with only one method. String that returns a string. That's it. We'll see why we use this in a minute. And now the thing is that the stringer interface is defined in the FUMPT package. FUMPT, F-M-T, short for format, that allows you to do FUMPT.print. And when you print a value, what the FUMPT package will say is, uh, does it satisfy the stringer interface? If it does, rather than just printing the values, I'm gonna call the string method and print that instead. So this is the equivalent of the two string in Java, except that it's completely different. Because here it's not because the, everything is an object and the object defines that method. Here it's just an interface defined on top. All the, method, all the types that define that method, string, are stringers, even if they don't know anything about that interface. So this is effectively, Lack 
like duct typing. You don't need to say name is a stringer. But name is a stringer because name has the string method, therefore satisfies my interface. So that's how it works. Uh, so if we run this, now we're just printing n, and n is a uh, name. When I print this, it prints William M. Smith because it's actually calling the string method. It detects that it has that, and it calls it. So this is pretty much like Go duck, like Python duck typing, but it's checked at compilation time. Uh, so it's not called uh, it's not called duck typing. It's called sub. I never remember this uh, substructural typing or structural subtyping. One of those. I can never remember which one it is. <laughs> structural subtyping, I think, uh, which is pretty much like duck typing, but com at compile time. So easier to find the errors. Cool. Something that I see very often in Python code bases are decorators. And decorators are really useful. So you can, you can define a decorator um, and use it later. So you can say, oh, this is an HTTP server. Uh, my handler is an HTTP server. And it has a do get, which is something that is the method that is called every single time there's an HTTP request that has uh, get method. So every single time I get a request with get method, I execute do get. Now, I decorate it. And by decorating it, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm using that at syntax, saying at auth required. And then auth required magically modifies my do get thing. How does this actually work? Well, the auth required, the way you define something like that is a function that has a function as a parameter. So this my func will be do get. Do get will be passed to auth required. And it returns, well, it returns check user. And check user is a function. So a uh, decorator is a function that given a function returns a function. That's everything it is. So, and then what we're doing inside is uh, just checking if there's a user parameter in the URL, and if it is there, we check. Uh, uh, so we, we actually check that the user is known, otherwise we say, no, it's not known. So you can implement this. Like, that code is awful. <laughs> I'm not a Pythonista. But basically what you can do is check that all the methods can check for authentication, and you define it only once, and then you just decorate all the methods that require authentication. Cool. Can we do this in Go? Well, in Go, functions are just values. Uh, they're type. They're, there's a type function, and you can have functions that return functions and functions as parameters and so on. So yeah, you can do that. Oh, before doing that, uh, the cool thing is that then you're running this. Hi. Wow, that's small. Says unknown user because we're not passing a user. And John says, hello, John. The second one executes to get. The first one stopped in the decorator. So that's exactly what went to doing Go. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, two steps. The first one, we're gonna see the decorator. And the decorator is down here. And we don't call it decorator, we call it wrapper, because it's a function that wraps a function. And auth required is a function that given an handler func, and a handler func is nothing else than a function. It's actually a function that receives two parameters, a response writer and pointer to a request, and doesn't return anything. That's the, it's the same thing as a handler func. So given a function, returns a function of the same type. And what it does is it checks if a user is defined. If it's not, says, okay, status forbidden, I know user, you cannot do this. Otherwise, it actually calls the function that was passed. And it returns that as a function. So func here, that's a uh, uh, lambda. It's a literal function that we're returning. So it's the equivalent of what we did in Python. Exactly the equivalent. Other than we have type annotations, basically. And then we don't have the at, uh, the at uh, syntax. We don't have that in Go. But what we can do is, rather than defining a function as we were doing before using func and the name, we can say var and the name 
and then a value, which is a function. And what we're doing is the function that we were using before, the hello function that has hi, whatever name you pass, we're passing that as the parameter to auth required. So we're basically getting that function, passing it to the uh, wrapper, and whatever we get as the result, that's the wrapped function or the decorated function that we finally use. So you can do exactly the same things. Uh, and we do, it, we do it pretty often. You're gonna see in Go very often uh, functions that given a function, return the function, and people think it's weird at the beginning, it's just decorators. It's exactly the same concept. Cool, so decorators in Go, you can do it, and you can run the server. Hi, what? Oh. Mac. Uh, if you don't pass the user, it doesn't work. If you pass the user, hi, John. So it works exactly the same. Uh, little, uh, little thing on the side. Uh, here I'm using the net HTTP package. And that's the package that we have in the standard library to define HTTP servers and clients. And uh, it's, this library, it's the library that we use in production for the download page of Google. So it's completely production ready. Uh, you can have it in production, uh, having users facing it directly. You don't need Nginx protecting it or anything. Just uh, uh, 10 lines of code are production ready. Exercises that we're gonna do. And now the last part is we're gonna talk about monkey patching. And I said before, no, you cannot do monkey patching in Go. What is monkey patching? Technically, according to Wikipedia, source of all truth, a, a, monkey patch, a monkey patch is a way to extend or modify the runtime, the runtime code of dynamic languages, so Go is not dynamic, so goodbye, uh, without altering the original source code. So yeah, Go cannot do this. Now, it cannot do it in general, but the only sane reason that I can think about using uh, monkey patching is testing. When you're doing testing, you might replace some parts of your program by something else to avoid having extra dependencies. So in this case, uh, our say hi function calls the authentication function. And now that authentication function is actually opening a URL to check with the backend, is this user authorized to do this or not? And then depending on what you do, you return something or uh, something else. Now, if you do this, the problem is that when you want to test, say, hi, you depend on that backend being accessible. So if your backend goes down or your network goes down or anything ha bad happens, your test fails. Even though your code is correct, which means that you end up having flaky tests, which are even worse than wrong tests. Uh, because you don't know when they're gonna fail. So rather than having this, what you do in, in Python is, oh, okay, let me, let me replace that auth function by something that doesn't go to, uh, through the network. And in, in Python, you can do it really easily. You get the globals and you say, you know that thing called auth? Just replace it with a lambda that says through, that's it. And now all users are authenticated. And you can test, say, hi, John, we'll say, oh, yeah, John is totally authenticated. Uh, and then you can say, uh, now for the second part of the test, uh, auth always says false. And then you pass, say, John, and we'll say, oh, no, no, unknown user. So you can run this, and it will just work. Cool. So how do we do this in Go? OK. In Go, the say hi function could be something like this. And not really different to what we had before. And the, fun the auth function is pretty much, so it's, getting a, it's doing a get request to the auth URL. So it's going to the backend and then checking that everything worked and the status was okay. So status 200 and so on. So it's pretty much the same code. Now, I want to replace auth. And there's a thing here that it's a little bit of a cheat. <laughs> so rather than using Funk, I'm using var. And the good thing about variables is that they can vary. So this variable auth is effectively a function 
So from this code, there's no difference on the way you use it if you declare this as far out equals func or if you do func out. It's exactly the same thing. Now, the difference is that when you do this, this is a variable. So in your test, you can change it. So you can say, oh, auth is now a lambda that returns true. Or auth is a lambda that returns false. And we do this pretty often. Now the next step is to say, you're crazy. You should not do this. This is a bad idea. And it could be a bad idea if people from outside of your package were able to do this. If people from outside of the package were able to modify what auth is, your package is very easy to hack. Bad idea. Now, the thing is that in Go, and it's something that I haven't mentioned yet, we don't have private, public, protected, and so on. What we have is, uh, is this exported outside of my package or not? So exported or unexported. And we don't have even those keywords. Because the way it works is if an identifier starts with uppercase, it's exported. If it's lowercase, it's not exported. Auth is lowercase, not exported. No one can change it outside of my package. And our test code is part of our package. So you can test safely. So yeah, if you run this, you could get exactly the same thing. So I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, in Go, we don't have inheritance. Then there's no inheritance. But there's uh, something called struct embedding that allows you to define, to export all the methods of a type onto a new type. So basically, you can say, uh, I have my proxy type, uh, which, is, which has all the methods and all the behavior of that type from the third party library. And then you can redefine things. So you could do it that way. Rather than modifying the actual type, you could create a type that has a slightly different behavior. And it's a different type. But then everywhere, yeah, because, I mean, if what you want is to modify the way the third party library works, modify the third party library. That's what Go says. And if that implies that you're going to uh, do a fork of that library, so be it. It's safer than, so you can either do that or create an adapter to that code that has the good behavior for you that you will be able to use in your code. But the, the rest of the code will be using that, one, that old behavior. Because otherwise, you could, do, you could break many things if you just change a function in a third party library. So we don't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If, I mean, it's probably not going to fail here. Oh, yeah, it fails. OK. Uh, so yeah, it says uh, you're trying to return one. Is type bool. No. Uh, the same thing if you said. Uh, there's a function that returns an integer, they could still fail because it could say you're trying to use a function literal of type function that, uh, that gives, given a string returns an integer as a type function a string that returns a bool. So also something that I really like of Go is the errors make sense. I come from C++ with templates. So that's a big difference. They, like you can actually read the errors and they make sense. So yeah, it's, you're doing Monkey patching is not really monkey patching. You're just declaring variables that you can modify. Uh, but it, this only works inside of your own packages. Yeah. Cool. One more thing. <laughs> so some random things that I really like about Go. And I think that uh, they explain, in part, why the language is so successful. One is static linking. And the good thing about static linking is that you have easy deployment. So if you have a server and you want to deploy your code to the server, SCP, safe, secure copy, works. You don't have to do anything else. That's it. Everything is inside of a binary. Even if you have external files like HTML and CSS and so on, 
We have even the option to put those inside of your binary. So your binary contains everything. So that's make, that makes deploying easier. Uh, DevOps love this. There's no dependency hell. And by dependency hell, I mean, uh, since you're putting all your dependencies inside of that binary, if the server has a slightly different version of the MySQL driver, you don't care because your program keeps on working the same way. And this is exactly the same thing that Docker provides, which is also one of the reasons why Docker is winning Go. Uh, we have a very similar philosophy. And this is great for CLIs. So if you're, if you're writing some code that you're sending to your clients so they execute it on their machines, if you do it in Go, you can just compile your code into a single binary, put that binary in a web server, people download it and execute it. That's everything they need to do. Now, the thing is like, oh yeah, but what if I want to, to I have my code, I, I write in, I, I code in Linux, come on people, and you're asking me to generate some X file for Windows. Well, you can do that too, and you can do it, so we have cross compilation. So from any platform, you can generate code that runs on any other platform. This is very useful because for people that are running on ARM, like if you're running on a Raspberry Pi, small things, running the compiler on it, it's really slow. Like Raspberry Pi, it's not the fastest thing on earth. But something that you can do is on, from your laptop, you compile a binary that will run on the Raspberry Pi. And then you just copy it there and it just executes. And that's something that works really well. There's a uh, all the tools, uh, also related to platforms and so on. Uh, Go works on Android, uh, which I think is awesome. And we're working on having official support for it. Not for the SDK, so it's not going to replace Java yet. But uh, it, will, it can replace uh, C and C++ for the things you normally do with the NDK. So NDK is the native, develop, native development kit. So if you're writing games uh, and everything you need is uh, being able to print things, network connections and files, things like that, very basic things. Uh, you're going to be able to write that, those on Go. The advantage of that is that uh, they're actually, so we have the Go mobile package, which is an abstraction over mobile platforms. So the same code will also compile and run on iOS and Windows phones when we get to those. But that's the idea. Uh, then, Something that people ignore very often, but I really like, it's tooling. Go has a lot of small tools that work really well. Go Font is something that allows you to write code that looks really, really ugly and click a button and make it look good. So pre-formatting, pre pre-printing. This might look like something not really important, but when the whole community uses it, it means that you can go see a third-party package and it looks like something that you could write. So you understand it better. And also for code reviews, it also means that you're not paying attention to ah, that blank space there, oh my god. You're actually paying, space, paying attention to the, what the code does. So it's, it's actually something really, really nice. Uh, go lint and go vet. As the name implies, like JS lint, JS lint and so on, it's just the compiler, the Go compiler doesn't have warnings. It compiles or it doesn't compile. Which means that sometimes you write code that you're just like, ah, but I would like to have a warning. Well, uh, go lint and go vet will do that. So if you have a print f, which is like with format, and the number of formats in the string doesn't match the number of parameters you're passing, the compiler will not complain, but go lint will. So you can, you can add things. Uh, it, it also complains about you're not documenting this, this thing, which is awesome. Because then you can basically say, no, no, no. You first pass go lint, and then I review your code. That makes your life much easier. Uh, GoVet is very similar. Go imports, it's uh, really interesting because in Go, oh no, I don't have Wi-Fi, whatever. Uh, in, in Go, you can, you can write code, okay? You write your code and you're doing import of packages outside. If you import a package and don't use it, it doesn't compile. And that, that's, that has a lot of like, it makes sense because you want to have as little dependencies as you want. And if that dependency is not even real, why could you have it in, product, in production? Now, some people complain about it. So we wrote a tool that does that. So if you have packages that you're importing and you're not using, when you run go import, that could be your safe hook. It will just remove all the packages that you're not using. And even cooler 
it will also add the, one that you, the ones that you're using and not importing. And it does it in a pretty smart way. So basically, it will look through all the Go code you have on your environment and find the, for the, find the package with the same name with an identifier inside, so fump.println. It will check for a package called fumpt with an identifier inside called println. And then it will add that one. So it works really well. And we executed internally at Google across all the Google, all the Google Go, Go code base, which is pretty big, and it works. So Java people like that a lot, but they don't have it. So, and then there's also Go test, which uh, I'm not gonna talk about it, but there's uh, all the unit testing. We have a framework for that. And it's actually Go test dash race. And I could say that everybody should use dash race. That will detect data races. Uh, everybody thinks that they don't have data races in their code. Uh, we did too, and then we run it, like once we had it working for Go, we run it over the standard library, and we do, we did find bugs, and those bugs were written by people that wrote the language. So probably you also have them if you're writing code that does concurrency. Uh, Go build will generate a binary, and it also has the dash race. So you could build a binary that has uh, uh, code, uh, data race detection, which means that it's gonna be really slow. But if you have 100 servers running, and you want to have one receiving some shadow, serve, shadow code, uh, shadow traffic, and if it crashes, there you go, you'll find a bug. So it's something that we also do, it's pretty useful. So yeah, all the tooling and static linking and so on. Yeah, uh, you're gonna, you, you can do all the testing that you normally do with other frameworks, you can do them in Go. It's very simple because we think that testing should be simple, so we don't have uh, assertions and so on. Uh, our assertions are like, if you wanna, comp if you wanna make sure that A is zero, you can do if A equals zero rather than writing an assertion. So we don't, we don't have assertion in the standard library. There's many people coming from Ruby and Python that are used to those, uh, so there's equivalent things in the community, no, but not part of the standard library. Yes? I cannot hear you, sorry. So I'm not sure I understood your question. I think that what you were asking was, if you have a lot of binaries using the same code, if every single time you compile a piece of, like any single binary, you're gonna recompile that code. Oh, yes, uh, so yes, that's, that's the case. If uh, you're using a third party package and that third party package, you, found, you find that there's a security bug on it, like SSL, yay, uh, that's the normal case. Uh, you will have to recompile your, your code because you're doing static linking, yes. Yes, and it, it, you will compile 300 pieces of code and it will take less than compiling C++. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, uh, so deploying, it really depends, so it really depends on the infrastructure that you have. It does depend. I'm gonna, I'm not really sure about that really. Nowadays, everybody, everybody uses uh, things like Docker for a reason. Everybody, when I say everybody, I say everybody on Hacker News, okay. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of people that use uh, Docker, and the reason behind it is the fact that you don't have to manage DLLs and dynamic libraries and so on. Is this the best solution? I could say that for most cases it is. Uh, for some cases, like if, you, if you're using a library for which you keep on finding bugs over and over, well, that's a bad sign already, but then, yeah, you could have the problem that you should recompile your program from scratch every single time, yes. A little thing about the compiler, uh, one of the reasons that Go, Google created Go was uh, the C++ compiler. It's really slow, uh, it has a lot of steps, I think it's 
seven or nine steps. And every single file is open every single time a file imported. So we did a little study and uh, in comp compiling one of the AdWords servers, uh, could recompile the strings.h more than 10,000 times, uh, which is not awesome. Uh, so Go does something different. It only opens one file er per time, which means that it's exponentially faster to compile. And at the exponentially, it's the, like the, the big O notation exponentially, not the marketing exponentially. Like it's really exponentially faster. Uh, so you should still compile, but it's much faster, yeah. Uh, so in conclusion, I think that Go is a lot like Python in the fact that it's a very simple language, uh, doesn't have many features, and it's simple to use. Uh, so it makes it flexible, uh, but it's also very fun. Flexible also, for a static language, I think that Go is very flexible. You can do really, thing, really uh, flexible things, like monkey patching in Go. Uh, it's also different in the fact that it's faster. Concurrency is part of the language, and I think that nowadays uh, language should have support, good support for concurrency. And it's also statically typed, which means that a lot of bugs that otherwise you could find via tools at runtime, you can find them directly at the beginning every single time you compile. Uh, so if you like Go, what should you do next? Um, there's golan.org is our uh, page. You will find all the information in there. Tor.golan.org is an awesome tool that I, I, like, I've been working on it a lot. And I've had to write AngularJS with JavaScript. It was fun. Uh, but basically, it allows you to run Go on the web server. So if you will have some, uh, like, OK, write a for loop. And then you write the for loop, and you click on Run, and it runs. So basically, you can try Go without installing it on your machines. And then Go Nuts, uh, Golang Nuts is the, the, mailing, uh, the mailing list. Nowadays, actually, there's more than that. There's also Slack community. There's also, well, there's, we've always had IRC. If you like IRC, there's also go, uh, has, um, hashtag Golang uh, for IRC, too. And I don't have the links to the slides, but there's links to the slides. I will send an email with the links to the slides. <laughs> That's going to be easier. Uh, thank you. And let me add one thing. This is very crappy, but whatever. Uh, that's the easiest way to communicate with me. It's on Twitter. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you have any questions, we have some time. Yeah. Scython, yeah. Uh, I see why with JavaScript, uh, because there's a huge amount of JavaScript lines of code and things that are already written in JavaScript that you don't want to rewrite from, from, from scratch. So adding types, it makes sense. It makes it safer. For Python, I'm not really sure it's really worth the effort, but I think it's an interesting effort anyway. Uh, I think that at least, if I'm not mistaken, in Python, uh, when they're adding the, the types, they're optional, meaning that you can have Python without types and run it with the new thing that supports types, and it should just work. And then you can add types slowly, uh, little by little, which is great. Uh, at least you don't break uh, like from two to three. Uh, it, you're just adding some things like that, which makes it interesting, because basically, where it could make the compiler faster, well, the interpreter faster because it really knows what it's dealing with. So it, it could be used to optimize uh, things like Django and things that are very used by people. You could actually have an effort. And there's a lot of people using uh, Django and many other things for Python on the web. So I think it's worth it uh, from that point of sense of supporting the community that already exists. From if I actually had to write something, I could start from scratch, yes. Yes. Is there, I mean, 
Okay, so the question uh, is uh, how do I migrate from Python to Go if Go requires to basically migrate everything at a time? Uh, so it doesn't. Uh, you can call Go from Python if you want to. Uh, I don't think it's a very good idea. I've seen people doing it. Why not? Uh, I think that the best solution in those cases is to have to migrate first to a more modern uh, infrastructure based on microservices or mini services, if you don't want micro, but basically rather than have just having one big binary that contains all your application, has small services, then detect, like find out what's the service that you have performance issues with. And that's normally what happens. It's like you have your whole system, there's one of the components that needs to be faster because there's concurrency, there's a lot of uh, data crunching, things like that. And uh, if you want to keep using Python, you could be like, oh, I'm going to replace that with C, right? So just add C on the, on the back. Uh, you could replace the whole service and rewrite it in Go. And that's what a lot of people do. Like, um, not Sound, yeah, SoundCloud. Uh, SoundCloud, they, that's how they started. They had a server that had issues because it was accepting a lot of connections from the outside, and, the, and it was doing some calls behind. So it was like, cache and so on. And for these kind of things, that's where Go works really well. So they just replaced that service uh, from, I think it was Ruby, but I may be wrong, and they, were, they migrated to Go. After that, the engineers were so happy that they started replacing many other things to Go. Yeah. yeah. There's a really good talk by a gopher, um, and I forgot his name. Ah, oh, that's so bad. Uh, but uh, he gave a talk about the way they started using Go in his company. And I forgot the name of the company. Oh, my God. He's going to hate me. But uh, what he did was, in a company, you have the code base, the main code base that everybody respects. And then you have the small tools that you create. It's like, oh, yeah, one time thing or something that it's something new and it's not related to the rest. So what he did was write that in Go. And then people noticed, like, <laughs> you wrote this in Go? Why? It's like, well, just use it. It's a one-time thing. They tried it. It was like, wow, that's fast. And then they started, like, read the code, and it's easy to read. So then people started to be more accepting of the new language. And I think that if you want to have, if you want to accept a new technology in a company where management is not technical, the best solution is to hide it at the beginning. <laughs> I think it's really the best solution. Because otherwise, if you say, oh, yeah, we're going to use Go now. It's like, what? We run the whole code base? No way. So I think that the best thing is like small new tasks. Just write them in, the, in, in something new. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so the, the, the question is, what's the difference between Go routines and coroutines, and also when Go routines become threats? So the difference between Go routines and coroutines, I'm not really sure about it, because the definition of coroutine itself changes depending on the context where you're talking about. Uh, one of the things is the co, I think it's because it's cooperative. So uh, basically, it's like, Python, uh, you have to call yield. If you don't call yield, the other Go routine will never get to execute. In Go, that's not the case. It used to be. Uh, in Go now, when you're calling functions and when there's a garbage collector and there's many other things that will yield for you. So we avoid a servation. So that's one of the, one of the differences. Uh, when a Go routine becomes a threat, well, in Go you can say you can execute as much as this amount of threats. So execute four threads because my computer has four cores. Makes sense. And then all the Go routines are going to be load balanced across all the threads that you have. Now, at some point, you could have a thread that blocks because one of the Go routines is doing a system call or things like that where the thread needs to call itself. That's the OS that requires that. When that happens, the runtime will migrate all the other Go routines that didn't know to block 
to a different thread. So you don't need to block. And that's, that's managed by the runtime itself. So you don't, get to, you don't get to play with threads. Unless you really want to, uh, there's, there's some really awful libraries like OpenGL <laughs> that, now OpenGL is awesome, but they have things like, this thing has to run on this thread, and now if it runs on something else, nope, it won't work. If you want to do that, you can actually do it with some really hacky things at this point. Basically, uh, you can actually attach, like basically using C Go, so you're calling Go, you're calling C from Go, and you can do magic things with that. But that's really advanced, and normally you should not need to do that, unless you're using OpenGL. Yes. So the compile code will spawn, spawn all the Go routines, and that's why it's so much faster, and you can run 16 million of them. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, main, the main point of having everything inside. So when you compile a Go program, you end up with a, with a binary. That binary has a very small runtime that does a garbage collection and Go routine uh, scheduling. Across, it's on one CPU. Every it's actually every single binary has that little thing on it. Not on one CPU. Well, the problem is, what is a CPU? One on one, as many cores. Yeah, one chip. Yeah, yeah. And you can have as many cores as you want, but it's yeah. Yeah. If you want to, yeah, so uh, if, for instance, let's imagine that you're using the Google Cloud Platform, uh, and you have one machine that has 32 cores. Uh, you don't have to do anything to use those 32 cores very efficiently. Just use many Go routines, and they will be load balanced across all the cores, everything will work. Now, if you have 32, machi 32 machines or one core each, now Go is not going to help with that. The runtime is gonna, not going to help with that automatically. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna use uh, the network package. The network package is really, really fast. Uh, we, I, at Google, we do a lot of networking, so we, we make sure that that's really fast. So uh, that's when you're gonna start using things like uh, Iris or other third-party packages that are going to allow you to create um, clusters of cores that connect to each other uh, you could also use, in that, those cases, you can start using things like Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically like the open source version of uh, Borg, which is the way we manage clusters at Google. So you can, have, you can use that and say, I want to run 100 tasks. Just run them over all the things. So you don't have to think about the threads in Go. You just you need to think about the fact that you should allow the runtime to use all the threads of your machine, all, all, at least as many threads as cores your machine has. Otherwise, you cannot spawn spawn them correctly. Uh, but can you repeat the question? So you have a multi-server system with multi-cores in each server. Yes, you're gonna have to. You're gonna have if you're doing something that works across many computers, you're gonna have to think about why you want them to work, how you want them to work. No, no. Uh, the the Go runtime is aware of one machine. That's it. Uh, if you want to go across different machines, you have to use something else, and there's many solutions for that. Uh, you can use Kubernetes, you can use Iris, you can use MapReduce. Uh, there's many things that are going to allow you to distribute a, ta a set of tasks over a, a set of machines. But that's not going to be the Go runtime. That goes back to the really interesting question. All this concurrency type about Go So uh, the question is, uh, why? <laughs> the question is, 
Yeah, so the question is uh, why using Go concurrency if Go concurrency is only inside of a node, not across the nodes? Uh, because nodes are big. I don't know a single node that has less than one CPU. Uh, I mean, I do know one. It's what we call at Google the F1 micro, and you pay less than one cent per hour. But you won't use that in production. So, so that's why. You have to care about how to distribute your workload across a, a set of machines. Yes, of course. But you also should care about how the workload is distributed across all the cores of your single machine. If you don't care about performance in a single node, there's a, another, a second good, very good reason to use concurrency, which is concurrency is not, concurrency and parallelism are not the same thing. Parallelism is being able to run one thing, uh, multiple things at a time, so you need more than one CPU. Concurrency is about the way you describe the processes. And it turns out that some processes, many processes are concurrent, and expressing those processes in a non-concurrent language, is very hard. So you're going to end up basically trying to transform something that is, either you transform something that is naturally concurrent into something that is not concurrent, because concurrence in your, prom that in in your language is not well supported, or you end up using threads, which are crazily expensive. I, I've written a Pascal compiler in Ada, so. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I know, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying that Go brings new things. It doesn't. I don't think there's a single thing that it's new from Go that any other language has seen before, except for one thing, the defer statement that I had never seen in any other language, but I may be wrong. But uh, yeah, there's, Erlang does concurrency very well, uh, it was not successful. It's not super successful. Why? Well, maybe because the tooling is not very good. Maybe because deploying it is not very easy. Maybe because the syntax is interesting. Uh, <laughs> the syntax of, uh, I mean, it, re it really depends of like the syntax for a lot of people coming from, uh, from um, procedural languages. Erlang is really hard to read. So that's also maybe it, 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 avo it was a problem for adoption. I'm not sure. Like, that was some time ago, anyway. But yeah, Go didn't, didn't bring anything new. It just brings a pragmatic approach to what we do at Google. That's basically it. Yeah. I was just thinking more of the interprocessor. So the question is, uh, the, is uh, the same way we have, we used to have net channels, uh, we could use something similar to spread the work across different channels, different work, the workers. Without planning, you just throw the jobs into the processor available. So, so that's, that's what MapReduce does. And MapReduce is one of the most complex projects I've ever seen. The code base for MapReduce is really, really complicated. There's many things that you want to take into account. And I don't think all of that complexity should be part of a language. I think that that's something that all the languages should have a similar solution. And MapReduce right now, it supports any language. And I think that that's much better than trying to move all the complexity of MapReduce into every single one of the compilers or runtime. So I think that that's, that's one of the reasons why that's the way it is. There was a question there. Yes? OK. So the question is uh, if I can comment about uh, the garbage collector performance. Yes, I can. Uh, so the garbage collector performance right now is not as good as Java's. But the amount of garbage we generate is much lower because we have things like pointers and values which are structs, which 
is coming to Java soon uh, with what we call, they call it struct values or something like that, I forgot. But it's not references. In Java, everything is a, refer uh, is a pointer. That generates a lot of garbage. So they're bringing it back to what Go has, basically. And, and so in Go, by default, you can allow, we can avoid that most of the garbage you're generating. Uh, when we wrote the, um, when we uh, developed the new version of the download page of Google uh, in Go, one of the problems was the garbage collector is not good enough. And indeed, it was not. So we worked on it. And we keep on working on it because it's, it's a very important part of the language. But uh, most of the problems that we had was the code was generating too much garbage. The solution for that, well, generating less garbage. And there's a, a bunch of techniques that come from other languages that you can use, object pools, and many other things that, that allow you to, to limit the amount of garbage collection that you need to do. Uh, one more thing on the garbage collection. The next version of Go will have a garbage collector that is uh, really interesting because it actually limits the amount of time you spend on garbage collecting. You can limit that. So you can say, spend only up to 10 milliseconds per second in garbage collection, which brings a new class of prawns, which is what happens if you run out of memory? What do you do? So there's a new set of prawns. But uh, that could be really interesting for people that are trying to do things like real time. Uh, you could make sure that if the garbage collector starts in the middle of your thing, uh, you're not going to have, you're not going to add more than 10 milliseconds to your uh, response time. But that's coming. Yeah. Yes? Okay, so the question is, does the Go runtime figure out how many threads it needs to uh, manage the workload that it has across all the CPUs? No, it doesn't. Uh, we think about adding that at some point. Right now, uh, pro like if I care about uh, how many threads I have, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, you can run. So there's a line of code, which is something like runtime dot numcpu equals runtime go max prox or some, no, the other way around. Basically, I'm saying you can use as many threads as cores are in this machine. And you just do that and it just works very well. Which means that you spawn four threads from the beginning, but that's, I mean, it's not that bad. Yeah. So the question is, um, one of the good things about Python is not only the standard library is very rich, but the open source community is very rich. You can find pretty much anything you might want to do already implemented in, in Python. Uh, in Go, we're still not there, but we're not far away. We have, we have a lot of uh, people doing new things in Go, and most of the things that you would like to have in Go, but you don't have them. Uh, like I've used, for instance, uh, Portalio or Image Magic, uh, things that are really in C, actually. And if you look for them in Python, probably they're just like a little bit of Python over the C. You can do that in Go. Uh, it's called C Go, and you can call C libraries from Go. And the thing is that it will look like it's pure Go. So uh, you don't have any, it's pretty much like Python. There's a lot of people doing that. That's a way of, if you find something that you would like to have and it doesn't exist, writing a, a binding for Go is small effort. Sorry, which one? Oh, okay, okay. So, do we have ORMs that are rich in Go? Uh, Depends on what you understand for an ORM. Uh, we have uh, MongoDB. That's not, that's different. Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm, so this is going to sound weird, but I don't like ORMs. So I don't really use them. Um, 
I'm pretty sure there is. If I had Wi-Fi, I let me see if I can. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> uh, let me try. Uh, so goddog. Dot org. Oh, does anyone you know the username and password? Um, I know this is my computer, so that's one second. I, I'm just gonna do one thing. I'm just gonna do a hotspot. That's gonna be much easier. Um, okay, three, two, one. There you go. Okay, so. Come on, T-Mobile. OK. Godog.org. It's my phone. OK, it worked. Yay. OK, so this, this page is uh, very important. Uh, Godog.org is where you find open source packages, written in Go. And it will search across uh, GitHub and the others, uh, Google Code and Bitbucket and so on. Oh, okay. So, okay, so I'm, I'm going to finish answering the, his question, and then we, you can ask many other questions outside. I'll be there. Uh, so yeah, ORM. Yay, there's ORMs. So Gorm, that's a good name. <laughs> uh, you can then go. It's, it's, it's a fantastic ORM, actually, so that's good. <laughs> and you can find the documentation, uh, go around. This doesn't have any documentation, which is a bad sign. It's ranked by uh, people that use it in the open source community. So this one, Bigo, is one of the most used. And this one has examples and documentation. So that's probably the one you want to use. So yeah, there's ORMs. By the way, um, just apply Python ORM every day. Oh, <laughs> that's probably why I don't like ORMs. I ha I've had bad experience with them in general. No. OK, so thank you. And if I have any other questions, I'm going to be outside. And otherwise, uh, that's my email. Oh, yeah, I'm going to keep those. Uh, if you want stickers, uh, there's stickers if you didn't have them before. The rest are going back to my office. Uh, and if you have any other questions, I'm going to be around here, or there's my email. And yeah, my email and my uh, Twitter handler. Thank you. <laughs>